Good morning, everyone. I'm Brian Parker, Eagle Bank's Chief Information Officer. I'd like to welcome you to our second Cybersecurity Awareness Month event. We at Eagle wanted to take this opportunity to provide all of you with some information <clears throat> from industry experts on some of on some cyber issues and help increase your awareness around these issues. Again, thanks for joining us this morning. I hope you'll find this discussion useful. If you have questions during the panel, please use the chat feature or hold them until the Q&A session at the end of the panel. With that, I'll hand the panel over to Shupro Ghosh, Eagle Bank's Director of Information Security and Information Security Officer. Thank you, Brian. And uh, as Brian said at the very beginning, we are actually recording this panel. So uh, we, we hope uh, that's okay with everyone joining. So uh, with that, I'm gonna introduce the panel very quickly before I go into a little bit of an overview of uh, what BEC is, because we keep on hearing about business email compromise. And uh, what we thought is just to set the stage because we're gonna have a spirited discussion. And before we get into that, I wanted to make sure that we kind of set the stage, give you a little bit of overview of what BEC is and what it covers and things like that. Uh, and to discuss that today with us, we have a, a imminent panel, uh, starting with Vince Chrysler, who's the CEO of uh, DarkCube. Uh, DarkCube is a, uh, is, is a information security company based in the Washington DC area. Uh, Ryan Grace, who is a engineer with uh, Deloitte Terbium, uh, Deloitte recently acquired Terbium. Terbium is a company that does a lot of uh, mining in the dark web and especially looks for a lot of domain lookalikes and things like that. Very, very relevant to the discussion today. Then we have Teresa Walsh all the way from London. Teresa is the global head of intelligence for FSISAC. FSISAC is the financial services ISAC that was, uh, and, and maybe Teresa can uh, take a minute at the end to explain to us how the ISACs were set up. If you have a little bit of time, it's pretty interesting. Every, every sector has an ISAC. And then we have uh, Julie Stoneberg uh, all the way from California. So she's up early. Good morning, Julie. And uh, she is with Proofpoint. Proofpoint is a vendor that is a leader in the email filtering space. So with that, I am going to go into a quick overview what, uh, of what B a business email compromise is. So as some of you know, BC, as business email is uh, often uh, referred to, is a sophisticated form of email phishing. It's a very low tech, but highly effective and lucrative uh, uh, manner of actually uh, attacking a customer. And this usually takes the form of the, uh, the attacker impersonating a person in the organization with a certain amount of authority, like a CEO or a CFO or the risk officer or the security officer. And basically what happens is the subordinate is tricked into parting with either information or to, uh, to, to uh, commit an act. And that act could be sending a wire, sending an email, disclosing information and so on and so forth. So how does this start? As I, as I mentioned, the start is we, we see an email coming in and usually what they do is they impersonate uh, your domain. So in our case, Eagle Bank, corp.com could be, uh, they could have slipped in an extra S or sometimes the letters are also changed and you have, uh, the E could be from a different alphabet set. Uh, so those are, those are very, very um, uh, sophisticated uh, domain changes, but those are the things that Terbium actually looks for us. So these things uh, come in, uh, the, the emails come into your environment uh, as a fish, which is basically a spoofed email. And then it uh, goes to a user, that user is tricked and that, uh, that that user could be clicking a link or responding to that email. And then the damage is done. The so social engineering portion is completed and the fallout, as I mentioned, could be money, data theft and uh, a whole bunch of different things. And those are the, some of the things that we're gonna uh, talk about. So as I mentioned, the most important thing is impersonation of a trusted figure gain access to the email system, target an individual uh, through which you get asset, uh, access to the assets, 
and then fool that individual into divulging secrets. Now there are different names for this too. As you can see, uh, uh, when, you, when you are referring to this in the uh, press, sometimes it's called employer account compromise, bogus income scheme, man in the uh, email scheme, CO fraud, and so on and so forth. But for our purposes, we're gonna call it a uh, business email compromise. This is definitely something that uh, one should be concerned about. It is growing at the rate of, uh, uh, in 2020, it was 4.2 million, uh, sorry, billion, uh, according to the FBI. And by the way, these are only the reported ones. There's a whole slew of uh, attacks that are not reported. So 4.2 is what's been reported to the FBI in terms of cybercrime. And out of that, 1.8 billion, almost 44% is BEC schemes. And who is impacted? As you can see from here, uh, we, we have looked at uh, some studies and it shows that it's, it's uh, organizations uh, from 500, uh, less than 500 to about a 1000. That's where kind of the sweet spot is because most of the uh, time these uh, organizations have uh, rudimentary uh, security uh, setups or they're they are sharing uh, uh, a environment with some other organization and uh, they, they seem to be the, the sweet spot. Um, how are these uh, targets coming in? Uh, we have seen that uh, Gmail is kind of the number one target as we can see over here. And it's usually it's coming in through free, free mail. So this is all the free mail providers. And by the way, we will make these uh, slides available to you. So Gmail is some of the other, it, it comprises of almost 60.6% of all the attacks. And there's other email providers too that are part of it like Cox and Virgin Media, Roadrunner and so on and so forth. And then uh, the registrars that are used for the lookalike domains, we can see over here that there are uh, registrars over here that, that are mentioned who are used for these uh, uh, lookalikes. And uh, some of the other uh, features is that uh, the, typically people who are responsible for handling wire transfers like a financial controller or someone in the finance department who has that capability is kind of targeted and the emails look very very similar to what a ceo might send and the reason is because they have compromised the ceo's email they've seen what the, what has been sent in the past and they kind of mimic that it could be the exact same language too and uh, it's very as i mentioned it's very well worded so for the person uh, uh, you know, receiving it, they, they might, they, they, they're easily fooled because uh, it's, it's, it's so well-crafted and tailored to what is being asked for. Uh, so a couple of BECs very quickly, wire transfer requests, we've talked about it. That is kind of the number one uh, vector because it's easy to uh, get a wire transfer done by, by impersonating. As you can see over here, uh, the example shows a request from a CEO uh, the second one is an invoice fraud, and this is an interesting one where basically an invoice is paid, but it's paid not to the uh, company that's supposed to get it, but it's paid to someone else. So basically what you do is you convince the payer that uh, your, the, 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 the company who has submitted the invoice, their wire details have changed and it gets uh, uh, wired to a different account. Uh, then we have payroll diversion. So basically you're supposed to pay someone on a certain account instead of uh, paying that person in their uh, payroll account, which, which could be, uh, you know, most, most uh, organizations now, now do wire transfers, right? For your payment, uh, ACH payments. It's sort of getting paid on your regular account. Now that is being changed to a different account. And before you know it, that money's gone. So this is basically someone's uh, uh, payroll details being changed. And then gift card requests. Gift card requests is something we might have seen. Uh, go buy 20 gift cards from someplace, uh, send it to me, and I want to give it out to uh, someone else. Like, for example, this example uh, is shown over here where a CEO is asking a, a subordinate, hey, can you get, get us uh, some, some gift cards? So those are kind of the, the main um, uh, types of BEC, and I've, I've taken uh, almost uh, uh, you know, 10 minutes to go over this, but I thought this was very relevant. And, and with that, I'm gonna actually turn over to my panel and uh, ask them. So uh, panel, are you ready? We're ready. <laughs> okay. So I just talked about uh, 
the FBI's uh, IC3 that they have recorded increases in both BC complaints and BC losses. And um, almost uh, 26 billion have uh, been uh, lost supposedly in the last five years uh, for the FBI. Now, Proofpoint has done a lot of research in this area, Julie. Can you speak to the evolution of BC? How is BC being, uh, you know, how, how, wh what has Proofpoint seen and how mm -hmm. has it evolved? And are the targets changing? And uh, has the data, you know, that has that been targeted changed? And, and uh, after Julie, you're done, uh, Ryan, we'd love to hear from you too, because uh, Deloitte does a lot of uh, investigations for, for in, in this realm too. So with that, Julie. Sure. Um, yeah, the evolution of um, these types of identity deception attacks has has really um, changed. What we saw pre-2011, um, 2011, um, that was a very, there were widespread attacks. Um, you were looking for um, cells of, of, com of um, counterfeit goods, that type of things. We then saw it switch over to personal data theft, um, credit card, information being stolen uh, with varied, uh, the scale was really varied. But what we're seeing now since about 2016 and what the FBI is also seeing is these are um, these attacks are now becoming much more targeted. They're, the bad actors are getting smarter and they're doing a lot more research. <laughs> their relationship mapping on um, LinkedIn, they're trolling so any kind of social media um, platforms so they can learn about their targets. Um, I had one that I saw the target had a whole page on dots and dogs, you know, the little wiener dogs. And so to make themselves more likable to the target, the bad actor put in a picture of that type of dog. They're highly, highly targeted. Um, they use a lot of social engineering tactics. They're compromising accounts, but to get those accounts compromised, they have to gain a level of trust from the employees. So these almost all start as identity deception, um, where they're impersonating either by spoofing the actual domain of the target, um, pretending to be somebody that they actually know, the target knows, which they can see in LinkedIn um, and other social media um, platforms. So once they get to know um, the target well enough, they can sometimes sit in a compromised account for years learning about relationships with business partners. Um, and that's where we see supply chain risk really start to go up. And we're starting to see that now across the board. But the attacks are very targeted using and um, impersonating somebody of that has a trusting relationship. So you can use a lookalike domain, you can spoof the domain of the actual target um, looking like a coworker or an um, employee, um, employer, or you can use the domain of a business partner. So a supply chain um, business partner's domain or spoofing um, their brand by lookalike domains, which you mentioned. But the attacks are now very targeted. They are not um, random and the bad actors take their time and um, research so that they make sure that when they get paid, they get paid. And it pays off um, to know who your target is. And we see that all the time. Thank you very much, Julie. Yeah. Ryan, what are you seeing uh, from uh, the, the Terbium perspective? Do talk about some of the domains and uh, some of the other dark web threats that uh, are relevant for the BC vector. Yeah, certainly. Um, so I think Julie made a lot of fantastic points. We really have seen a transition from kind of those widespread just spray it out there type of uh, phishing business email compromise campaigns to the very targeted, um, the targeted ones, which use a lot of social media, open source intelligence. We see a lot of um, impersonation accounts on different social media platforms, whether it's Facebook, Instagram, or most often LinkedIn, um, impersonating high level uh, people, CEOs, other C-suite executives to kind of leverage that and build out a profile to then um, you know, conduct these attacks. And, uh, you know, with that, um, yeah, the sophistication has really increased. Um, and we see, uh, you know, Owen said that also the typo squatting of domains, it's something we track a lot at Terbium, I'm sorry, excuse me, at Deloitte. Um, 
And uh, with that, you know, it's, it's kind of a variety. We see the typo squatted. So maybe, you know, it's not eaglebank.com, it's eagle-bank.com. Or we also see some, uh, you know, prepended or appended domains. Just there's a, a very big mix of how these actors will, you know, create a fake domain um, and then use that alongside the open source intelligence they've gathered to conduct, uh, you know, a very targeted um, business email compromise attack. Uh, in addition to that, um, so kind of outside the scope of what we've spoken about so far, um, one thing which is a little more niche, a little more sector specific, uh, we have seen requests for payments or investments um, in cryptocurrency uh, just a few times so far. So not a huge thing, but it is interesting that as cryptocurrency becomes a little more mainstream, a little more accepted in, I guess, more traditional business industries, uh, we do see requests for payment in that and not in like a ransomware type of way, but more like, hey, we're interested, uh, you know, perhaps it's someone impersonating an executive. Uh, and we've seen this um, uh, in more of like the private equity space. You know, somebody would say, hey, we're very interested in making an investment in this cryptocurrency. Please send X to this wallet. And if there is a background within the company of investing in cryptocurrency, it's a great way for a malicious actor to get paid and get paid in a much more anonymous way than the money trail you would see in traditional business email compromise. Fantastic. Well, that, that's that's actually a, a, an interesting uh, uh, point, especially when we go into the financial side of things. And uh, who better to talk about the financial sector than Teresa Walsh from the FSI SAC? Can you uh, talk to us a little bit about what do you see of BC in uh, the financial sector? How is it being impacted? What are you seeing in your uh, because you know, FSI SAC has a huge reporting base. I, I've actually forgotten how many users you have now. FSI SAC used to be in the U.S. Now it's global. That's right, Supra. So we do have um, thousands of members worldwide, and especially when it comes to the banks, they are definitely seeing this type of activity, and um, not just for themselves, but also for their customer base. And if you can imagine, you know, our our, our members represent a very large customer base around the world, um, considering insurance accounts, mortgage accounts, uh, lo student loans, or anything else that you might think of that you rely on the system, systems for. Now, over the years, over the decades, the banks especially have become very adept at trying to protect themselves um, from cybersecurity type of attacks. However, it is much harder to also extend that around your customer base um, because you, you can see what type of emails you're getting to your own employees, but you can't necessarily see what emails your customers are getting, especially your business customers. And if they are being scammed out of some type of money or, you know, even their payroll getting diverted as, as you mentioned beforehand, um, it's very hard for them to do that type of monitoring. And we have to rely on knowing the customer and knowing their type of um, behaviors when it comes to payments. Um, but sometimes it is hard, you know, members, you know, customers who are, who are corporations, especially, are investing all the time. They're conducting, you know, dozens, if not even hundreds of transactions every day, every week. Um, so it can be very hard to detect these things. We do so by trying to put out a lot of education to the customer base. Probably most of you uh, will see something from Eagle Bank, maybe on the website, talking about what you can do to protect yourself. But it is quite pervasive. As Julie mentioned, um, they are getting more targeted, but you have to also understand the volume that's getting pushed out from these attackers. Um, I mean, just this year alone, for instance, for FSISEC, we've had almost about 2,500 accounts uh, reported as potential money mail accounts involved in business email compromise type scams. And that's a lot. That's only the things that we have visibility on. Imagine all the things that we don't have visibility on. And even from that amount, it's almost $75 million worth of fraud attempted just for this year alone. And again, just from what we have visibility on. And even from that, 
probably half of them don't even mention a dollar amount at the time. And so um, it, it's even more than that, potentially double, potentially, you know, 10 times as much when you try to open it up to um, corporations, uh, big and small and of all different types of shapes and sizes. So this has a significant impact. If you do look at cyber insurance claims from year to year, you'll find that BEC actually does score at the top nowadays, even over ransomware. That's, wow. that's not to say necessarily that ransomware, you know, is, is less important than business email compromise. But when it comes to the claim amount, it's making a difference. And this is why it is so important for the financial sector. And again, not just for us, but for our customer base too. So we have to work together. We have to understand what the threat trends are and work as much as possible together to try to, to, try to protect everybody. Thank you, thank you. Uh, I, I do have a follow-up question on this and I'll come back to you a little later. Uh, by the way, uh, folks on the bridge, if you have any questions, uh, please, put, we, we do have a Q&A section, but you know, if, if it's something that's relevant to what's being discussed, put it in the chat and the chat is at the bottom of your screen and uh, uh, Brian or I will uh, pick it up and, uh, and, and uh, make that available to the, uh, to the panel, okay? So if you have any questions, don't hold back. This is the time to ask the questions. Vince, uh, we talked about the financial sector, but your, your client base is beyond the financial sector. You're working in the DC Metro. What are you seeing? And talk to us about, uh, you know, with, with, with a certain amount of, uh, I guess, anonymity on, on some of the things that you've seen. And, uh, you know, how, how is this region a little different from some of the uh, other regions? Yeah, you know, as a core part of our business, we're working with small and mid-sized companies, you know, everything from dentist office to car dealerships to accounting firms, and we're seeing these all day, every day. Um, our primary channel in the market is going through managed service providers. And so, you know, most of most of the companies at, at the smaller end of the market are hiring a firm to manage their IT systems for them, right? Because it's complex enough, they don't have the resources to hire a full-time team. Um, and so, you know, as you go down market, and I think, you know, probably a, a lot of folks on this call are in this space, you know, you may not have access to the same resources in terms of the IT infrastructure and security teams that a larger company might. So your email system might not detect the, you know, the, 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 the domain being misconfigured. You may not have it configured correctly to say, hey, this is coming from an outside source, even though it says it's coming from my CEO. Um, you know, what's what's fascinating is just, the eagerness of the financial folks in the company to satisfy the execs um, and the requests that they'll do are, you know, if you look at it in a vacuum, it's like, why would anybody do this? Um, but people follow through because they're in a meeting, they're on a call, they're busy. My boss asked me for a Google Play gift card and I'm, we're running to Walmart to buy a Google Play gift card for my boss, right? Like that's just, it's just, it's crazy, but people do it. Um, we're, we're also seeing super a lot of, uh, you know, somebody will come in and invoice um, as another customer, right? So they'll send an invoice in, that invoice will fail. They'll say, oh, our account changed. Here's our, can you please update our account number? Um, and, you know, you, you wire 50K or 100K or more. Um, and if you don't catch that fast, you know, that's gone, right? It's, so it's, it's amazing um, the, the creativity of these. And finally, I'll say, you know, the volume of what we're seeing, these, these attacks, and we're going to talk a little bit later on about some of the indicators, but these attacks are really easy to automate. It's really easy to write a computer script that will say, I'm going to pick their domain name uh, and I'm going to send an automated email to, you know, 500 companies. And if one of those companies hits, you know, I just, you know, I'm making a thousand bucks an hour, which tell me, tell me how many jobs out there that where you can make a thousand bucks an hour. So. Thank you for that. And uh, my follow-up question was, you know, as 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 you, as your firm is kind of involved with uh, a lot of the uh, response and recovery, and also trying to set up uh, different layers of security, what are some of the um, indicators of these phishing attacks, or what we in the inf uh, industry call TTPs? That's uh, 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 tactics, uh, tactics, te uh, techniques, and uh, procedures or processes. What are what are some of the things that you're seeing in the TTPs? 
Yeah, and this kind of goes to one of the questions that came into the chat about does it always involve a visibly faulty domain name? And the answer is no. I mean, a lot of times you'll see the CEO name or the COO name or the CFO name. And it's like, if you click on it, it's a Yahoo address, but people just don't take that extra step of clicking. Um, the TTPs here, you know, there's always urgency, right? There's always some form of urgency that's involved. Um, and, you know, when you're talking about training your employees, you know, the, the, first, the first thing that should kind of cause the hair on the back of your neck to stand up is if a request gets sent through that's urgent, take a second look. The second thing we often see is a sense of secrecy. Um, one of the one of the more creative ones I saw uh, was uh, an email from a CEO to somebody in the finance department saying, "Hey, we're we're a publicly traded company. We're considering an acquisition of another company. Within the SEC, this is a very very highly protected transaction. If you mention this discussion to anybody, our company could be fined and it could be a really big deal. So please keep this secret. I'm trusting you to help with this, and then asking them to do a wire transfer, right? And so like." elements of you shouldn't talk to this or I'm busy, I can't talk, don't call. So any of those sorts of, of things where it's not like, hey, let me know if some, if this is, if this feels off um, is, is a great indicator. Um, in terms of kind of something I would say around, you know, protecting yourself, you know, I think you have to assume that any sort of email-based communication and this even goes to text messages or some of the some of the other platforms you might use for messaging. You have to assume that th there's a potential for it to be compromised. And you should think of communications in two bands of communication. So if you get an email from your CEO to transfer money, you know, pick up the phone and call or text or Slack or you know, use a different band of communication to uh, to to confirm that that request is okay. I, I, we've definitely seen examples where somebody will get an email from the CEO and they'll say transfer this money and they'll write back, is this really you? <laughs> and of course the attacker says, yes, it's really me, go do it. Okay, thank you. Um, so, you know, it, it is, these, these folks are talented and creative. They're doing it all day, every day. So they, they're really good at manipulating the human psyche. Right. So Julie, uh, uh, what, what is proof pointing? I mean, proof point sees a lot of these, uh, uh, you, you, you are thwarting several of these uh, attacks, you are, uh, doing a lot of uh, uh, reconnaissance on behalf of the customers. What are some of the TTPs that uh, Proofpoint is seeing? So same, uh, everything that Vince just said, I was shaking my head vigorously. Um, I absolutely, you need to be, um, the first thing we recommend is always training, 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 training. Make sure your employees know what the tactics are that are being used against them and give them um, policies um, procedures to follow when they see it. So that way they're not sending it around to their friends saying, hey, does this look weird to you? Um, let's make sure that they know how to handle it when, it, when they see it. But there are going to be things that um, you're gonna wanna try to automate. Um, anyone, anywhere can spoof any domain they want. Um, and those emails will pass SPF and DKIM. That's why you see so many attacks coming in using Gmail but they can spoof anyone they want. And Gmail or Hotmail or Yahoo is obviously gonna pass SPF and DKIM. And there's no protection when it comes to spoofing of a domain. That's also why we've been able, we've actually seen attacks um, happen where over half a million dollars has been moved. This is within the last month I got called in. And it was a domain that didn't even, it wasn't even registered. Um, anyone can claim to be anyone out there. So DMARC is going to be super important. Um, we also recommend um, using email blocking based on criteria around IP age, uh, I'm sorry, domain age, um, originating IP, IP reputations. So a lot of your gateways are going to be able to do that. So I recommend, I always recommend looking at the domain age because bad actors will um, spin up a new lookalike domain and use it the same day. If you're looking for things that are under 24 hours, I mean, think about it, how many emails are you receiving from companies that are less than a day old or their domains are less than a day old? That's a really good indicator that that's a bad IP or a bad domain. Um, so Could training- I, uh, for a, min uh, 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 yeah. a minute. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned DMARC. Would you would you yes. take a minute to explain what DMARC is? And you know, maybe, maybe we should talk about the DMARC, uh, SPF and DKIM because these are three concepts which are uh, kind of interwoven and- uh, mm -hmm. 
maybe, maybe uh, we, we, you know, and uh, other panelists do do pitch in and uh, add to what uh, Julie has said. But this is an important uh, mitigation strategy. So when it comes to spoofing of a domain, um, DMARC is the only pro email authentication protocol that actually addresses spoofing of a domain. Um, it actually takes into consideration the display domain in your email. So when you get an email that just pops up and it says, this is from supro at eaglebank.com, um, well, DMARC is going to look at that display domain and say, okay, do, do they have a DMARC record? And then they use SPF and DKIM to validate using Eagle Bank's SP, um, DNS entries for SPF and DKIM. But if you don't have a DMARC policy on your domain, then anyone can say they're you and they can um, get that email delivered and it passes SPF and DKIM. So it's important, SPF and DKIM are the foundation of DMARC checks. You still have to do SPF and DKIM, but DMARC is the only one that actually addresses what's in the display domain. It's a highly technical process implementing it. I had somebody, on my first day at Proofpoint, I heard the phone ringing and six feet away, I could hear the customer screaming. He was very upset because he had read about DMARC on Friday, decided it was a great idea, put, him, put his own domain to reject immediately without doing any of the work that's necessary. And all of their emails were blocked and they couldn't figure out why they thought it was something that Proofpoint had done, but it was actually something they had done in their DNS. So I don't recommend taking it on lightly. <laughs> it does, um, there are a lot of things that have to go into implementing a DMARC policy. 50% is in your control. 50% is in the control of your third-party senders like marketing platforms um, or uh, third-party applications that are sending email on your behalf. Say you have a uh, contact us form on your website and they're routing those emails through say SendGrid. Those third party senders control half of it. And if their emails are misconfigured, the emails look like imposter emails, but they're getting through passing with their SPF and DKIM, which is also how supply chain risk starts. So DMARC's highly technical. Um, it, I do full one hour webinars on just how to how DMARC works. So I, I don't think we have the time to dive too far into it. <laughs> but um, knowing that that is the one protocol that actually addresses spoofing and you can actually reduce your risk of um, phishing and spoofing of your domain to other companies um, by ut utilizing it. Um, I think that's the first place we recommend starting when you're when you're seeing a lot of phishing and um, identity deception associated with your own domains. Yeah, uh, so Teresa, uh, you know, it just so happens that the first time I heard about DMARC was at a uh, FSI SAC conference and FSI SAC used to have a DMARC working group. Uh, and uh, the DMARC working group basically focused on uh, trying to get uh, DMARC as, uh, uh, as, as a standard within the industry, especially between financial organizations so that we ourselves didn't get uh, <laughs> spooked. So uh, maybe, maybe you can talk to us a little bit about how and what uh, the financial services industry is doing with uh, some of the BEC mitigations and what are some of the areas, and especially if you can uh, add to what Julie said on DMARC, that would be good from the financial services perspective. Yes, we are very strong supporters of DMARC. We use it ourselves as well. Uh, so uh, not just a, a longtime listener, but also a client uh, <laughs> in that sense. But what's great about it is that it, it doesn't actually cost you anything. You know, you can't implement it for free. There are free versions out there. Um, so there is an organization called the Global Cyber Alliance, for instance, that we um, do support. And they go all around the world actually championing DMARC and um, basically teaching people how to do it. Um, as Julie mentioned, you know, I'm not surprised that she does one hour presentations on how to do this because it's not necessarily as easy as flipping on a switch. Um, you do need to understand the impact to your company and also configure it properly. I think in probably cybersecurity, we're probably always constantly saying that configure it properly. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, you know, if you, if you don't, um, it, it can't miss things or it can block things too. So when I used to work for 
for the banks, <laughs> there were, you know, probably uh, when we implemented some new controls, probably, you know, our traders or, you know, investment bankers or something would come, you know, just railing against it because, of course, we've done something that blocked what they're doing. Um, so you need to know your company, know what they're doing today, knowing what they're sending out, what they're receiving. Um, if you do have like um, some sort of customer portal, um, like, like, a, like a DocuSign or something where you're setting up um, them somewhere else to to do some sort of function um, that could be impacted by DMARC. So you do have to do it with a plan, do it smartly, um, make sure that uh, you're able to um, understand the impact, just like with everything before you implement it. But uh, really another thing uh, you can do is some um, some communication uh, exercises, as, as Vince was mentioning earlier, if your CEO says, can you send me this money? pick up the phone. If you have an internal web chat or something, what's up, um, signal him, whatever you might want to do to say, hey, was this really you? Um, and sometimes it's about knowing behaviors. Um, sometimes it's about having a second authority that you have to ask permission for, for anything over 20,000, something like that. Um, it depends on what works for your company, for your business. Um, if it's your CEO asking for it, do you have a CFO that you can double check with them? You know, if if they did build up that sense of urgency that, you know, they're in Malaysia and they need they they need to make a big deal, you know, <laughs> any day now, um, you know, check on it. You know, it, it's okay to ask because believe me, it is a headache afterwards if you don't <laughs> and to try to get that money back. And nowadays with faster payments, with cryptocurrencies, as uh, as was mentioned, and the gift cards especially it's really difficult to get that money back. So sometimes it is, you know, technical, like things like DMARC, and sometimes it's non-technical and, and things like asking, talking about it, knowing each other, knowing what your company is investing in and not being afraid of asking questions as well. And, you know, I, I think it's always better to be safe than sorry, uh, but, you know, what a lot of our own members are doing and some of them, some of them are very big, huge companies that are operating, you know, all over the globe and some others are, are you know, small institutions where I grew up and, you know, we had uh, a farmer state bank and it was the only one around. And, you know, I remember the day we got an ATM and it was a big holiday in the town. Um, and, and, you know, those, those people, you know, I, they were my neighbors and they didn't have an IT person, you know, it was somebody trying to figure it out. So, um, you know, in some ways when you're smaller, that's a little bit better because you can just say, hey, Bob, did you mean to send this to me? Uh, but in other times, um, you might not have the technical expertise or budget to set something up as well. So I think it's always good to, to have a mix of the technical and non-technical. Some things you might even have in front of you and you don't even realize it. So for instance, um, there are some Outlook features that you can set that if it's an email coming from Outlook side of your company, it will actually put up like a, a banner or, ex, you know, maybe an external slug in the subject line. So you can, you know, if it's somebody pretending to be for your, your company, you can see right away, this is not for my company. Uh, we even have some members who put that in, in great big yellow bolded letters at the top of every email that this is not from your company. This is external, so beware. Um, but sometimes just even basic phishing uh, exercises, there are now lots of these types of classes online as well, where it kind of teaches you a little bit of basic cybersecurity. I think sometimes our, our the younger generation, our kids are learning a little bit more than we did. Um, you know, <laughs> when you start up with a telnet, when you're a kid, it's much, much different than today. Uh, when they're having YouTube, they're having social media, they're having all these different ways to pretend to be somebody else and to get to you and ask you to do something for them. So um, just because you might be a smaller institution, maybe a, a floor shop or, you know, uh, or a, a, even a, a community college doesn't mean that um, that budget has to be a hindrance for you. You can still do a lot of non-technical things to, to try to fight against this. Thank you. So I'm going to try and uh, uh, focus on, uh, we've got about 20 minutes left, um, on the recommendations, right? Um, we have customers on the line and we've told them what BEC is. We've told them the threat of VC. We've told them some of the things that are happening. Um, now on the recommendations, uh, Julie's gone through DMARC, SPF, DKIM. Uh, Teresa's kind of added uh, uh, additional data to that uh, from the financial services perspective. 
Uh, I'm going to uh, focus the, uh, the, 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 this question to both Vince and Ryan, and we'll start with you, Ryan, is what are some of the recommendations that you see, especially from your side of the house, which is associated with domains, associated with uh, lookalikes, associated with uh, email, uh, fake emails and things like that. So if you, could, if you could talk to what are some of the precautions or best practices that a business could uh, avail of that would be very, very helpful. Yeah, yeah. So I think when it comes to the different uh, precautions and if necessary remediation steps you can take, you kind of want to break it down into three different categories. Um, within like the prevention sphere, there's the internal steps um, like setting up DMARC, like encouraging anti-fraud training, um, you know, just kind of building a culture of security within the organization. And then uh, what I focus on mostly in my work is the external aspect of that. So that is us going out every day, me and my team, looking for typo squatted domains, variations of a seemingly legitimate domain that is being used, uh, you know, to conduct these phishing attacks. Um, and, you know, going beyond just whether or not this domain exists, whether it has a, an MX record. Um, like Julie had mentioned earlier, how long has the domain been active? Just a few weeks ago, actually, we had a domain that um, it popped up for one of our customers. It uh, you know, engaged in the classic business email compromise scheme where they requested uh, from, you know, the accounts uh, manager within the company, um, a, you know, kind of a, a last minute invoice for supposedly late payments. Um, but for a couple of reasons, uh, you know, they caught it. Um, first, it was flagged as an external email because it was a typo squatted domain. Um, and then also they had some, uh, they had done some training uh, during, you know, over the course of the pandemic, I believe. Uh, to catch these types of things. And then they sent it to us. And, and that's how we get into more of the remediation space. So this business email compromise attempt has already occurred. And we were able, um, the uh, Deloitte team was able to get that domain taken down, you know, I think within 24 hours of it, you know, initially being created. Um, so we kind of went, ran the full gamut of a business email compromise attempt um, from it being created, the attempt, uh, the internal catch of that by our customer and then the takedown on our part. And takedown, are you working with law enforcement or is this something that you're working directly with the registrars or the email? Yeah, so that's working directly with the registrar. Um, us and a, a third party vendor we, we work with, um, you know, we're able to communicate that to the registrar um, and then with all the re uh, needed documentation um, to, you know, get that taken down almost immediately. The only time we really run into issue with that is when it's a, uh, you know, a Russian hosted or Chinese hosted um, email address, but that's not super common. Um, and then I guess to speak a little bit more about the uh, kind of external measures you can take to, uh, you know, and just mitigate risk. We look for obviously typo squatted domains, those variations that could be used for business email compromise. We also keep our eyes out on the dark web um, and you know, open web as well for credential exposure. Um, and uh, particularly in the case of CEOs, we offer uh, fingerprinting technology. So we're able to take the personal data. So anything from name, email address to passport number, social security number, um, uh, hash that, put it under a hash and then search for it. So I don't know what your social security number is but we're able to look for it on the dark web open web and social media. And then if we find it, then we can indicate that there is some level of exposure for an individual that, um, and then how that information could be used to conduct business email compromise. So, um, you know, it's both building those internal defenses, making sure people know what these attacks look like, as well as getting an idea of what information uh, within your organization is exposed on the internet and how you can take that uh, to you know, bolster your defenses, whether it means like, hey, this email address is exposed alongside a password. Um, make sure you're cycling those passwords on a regular basis. Additionally, we look for third-party breach exposures. Um, and that's one of those instances where uh, you know, maybe an employee in your organization is using their corporate email address for Facebook. And then that Facebook password gets, gets popped and um, you know, all of a sudden, just because they use their, and, and maybe they're reusing passwords. So all of a sudden, just because they use their corporate email address for social media, or, you know, to sign up for some subscription online, 
uh, now you have a huge risk within your organization. So, um, you know, we're looking out for uh, the, that different type of exposure um, on open web, dark web, social media, and how that can be used to conduct business email compromise attacks. Thank you, Brian. Vince, uh, what are you recommending to your customers, especially the small to medium businesses in the DC area in, in, in terms of the BEC threat? Yeah, I, I would give everybody on the call two assignments that if you haven't done, you absolutely need to do. One is if you don't have two-factor authentication deployed, you're wrong, um, period. Um, it doesn't prevent everything, but it makes it a lot more difficult for somebody to compromise an account. And all of this advice in terms of BEC is out the window if your CEO's email account gets compromised and it comes from his, real, his or her real account. So two-factor authentication is, is required today. Google is pushing it out to 150 million users, right? They've made the decision it's required on Gmail. You need to do it, you need to do it on social media. Every account you have that can do two-factor, do it. If you, can't, if, if you have a service that doesn't support two-factor, I would question whether you should use it or not. The second is a very simple configuration that can be done in Office 365, that can be done in Gmail. Um, at pretty much every email service is the external banner. You've heard us mention it a couple of times. A lot of these things are coming from outside sources and the flag that says, hey, this is coming from somebody outside your organization is enough of a warning to keep somebody from following this. So if, you're, if your organization doesn't have those two things, you're gonna be in trouble and, and somebody's gonna have success on BDC. It doesn't mean we're gonna prevent it completely. Um, from there, I go into things like, you know, you need to think about what your business process is for making a wire transfer or changing uh, customer account information. There needs to be two, two people involved in some form or fashion. You need to think about using two different mediums so it's not just email driven um, to make sure that, you know, if something gets, if one account gets compromised, you're not going to lose, you know, a couple hundred thousand dollars. Um, things like, do you have an email address for, for reporting phishing attacks? Because if people feel like there's a place to report it, they're more likely to do it than just ignore it. So even if you don't monitor that email very often, just having a place, giving users an option to send something and say, hey, this is concerning, uh, gives them an outlet and is helpful. Of course, you can do phishing training. Um, Amazon actually just released a free cyber education course. So if you Google Amazon cyber training, you'll find their free course they just released that covers a lot of the stuff that's, you know, it's an expensive training course that, that you can get for free. Uh, two other things, you know, if you haven't done a tabletop exercise in this space, it's a great way to get leadership thinking about it. Um, and a tabletop exercise doesn't have to be complex. It can be, you know, a couple of questions. We got a we got to sit down around lunch on a Zoom if you're still virtual, if you're in person, you know, brown bag lunch, um, and just ask the question, what happens if somebody tra accidentally transfers $100,000? Uh, how do we get that back? You know, you're a, you're a customer of Eagle Bank. Um, how, who would you contact? How, what, what information do they need? How quickly do they need you to talk to them uh, in order to try to, to, to claw that money back? And then my final bonus for anybody that's technical out there and likes GitHub, um, there's a tool out there called DNS Twist. And it's a really cool tool. You can type in a domain name. It'll do a bunch of different variations on that domain name and tell you if they're registered. So it's really a fun thing if you have somebody technical that, that knows, again, knows how to use GitHub and, and Python scripts. Um, you can drop your domain name in there and actually see if somebody's trying to uh, register, if somebody's registered a domain name that's close to yours. That was a lot of information and thank you. By the way, this is really funny, but uh, last night I came across this cartoon of Bart Simpson, okay? <laughs> Bart Simpson writing on the board, I will use MFA. And I sent it to Brian Parker and our head of infrastructure, Brian Chambers last night. So as you can imagine, if Bart Simpson's uh, writing, I will use MFA, it's becoming uh, mainstream. But thank you for sharing the info about Gmail turning on um, uh, two-factor authentication. And I, if I'm not mistaken, uh, Microsoft uh, and its uh, family of products, MSN, Outlook, Hotmail, has also been promoting that. So I think two-factor is going to become very, very common. And uh, especially if, uh, as uh, Ryan mentioned, if you're reusing passwords on different uh, uh, platforms, that becomes a a challenge 
And uh, if you are using uh, Google's or Gmail's uh, uh, password locker, it actually helps you check if you have the same password and makes you change those if you have that setting turned on so that you have a different password for all your uh, favorite sites. Like if you're using Netflix and Amazon Prime, you, 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 you can use different uh, passwords on each because you, know, you don't want your Amazon Prime to be disclosed to uh, someone if Netflix was disclosed. So, um, okay, so that, that, that was pretty good. Um, so I'm just gonna, uh, I'm, I'm looking at the questions, if there was any other questions uh, that was uh, coming in. Uh, we talked about the faulty domain. Uh, anything else about the visibly faulty domain uh, question that was asked? Is BC always uh, involves a faulty domain? And I, I think Vince respond to it and Teresa uh, also added that it's not faulty, but it's it's a domain, uh, what do they call it? Homophobic or homo homorphic? Uh, I, I forget the exact name it's called. Yeah, sometimes it's just trying to imitate it. Like I said, you know, it could be like substituting a one for an I or, you know, a five for an S or even something not even related to it <laughs> at all. Um, so, uh, but keep in mind, you know, maybe next time you open up an email, see how easy it is to see what the email address is. You know, if you're using webmail, it might just show the person's name and not their email address. If you're on your phone, you might not see hardly anything from it. Um, so, you know, just you know, try to be a little bit more self-aware maybe about um, where to even see those types of things because, you know, we can give you kind of fancy tips like hover your mouse over the hyperlink and things like that. But, you know, depending on what type of device you're using, that might not be actually very easy. So, um, you know, just try to, you know, right today, you know, try to be more aware of what does actual email look like when it comes to you, how easy it, it is to look at the domain of the sender. You know, if you are a little bit more savvy, how do you look at the header information and interpret that as well? But, uh, uh, but just keep in mind that, yeah, it's not always the compromise of the actual account. And it's not always an imitation. It can just be maybe sometimes a Gmail account or a Hotmail account. Thank you. Um, anyone else uh, before, uh, there's another question that's come in and I, I, I want to uh, at least respond to this, make sure everyone's got a chance. Okay, so the other question that came in um, is recurring password changes recommended. Uh, people have talked about recurring password changes and together with that, uh, I do want to, uh, throw in complexity that is using different uh, letters of the alphabet and special characters, uppercase, lowercase, as well as the length of the password. I'm gonna start with you, Vince, because uh, this is uh, uh, might be something up here. <laughs> yeah, you know, it, it is a question that, that we see a lot. It used to be, you know, you need to change your password every 30 days or every 60 days. You know, that's assuming, um, Kind of the, the reason behind that is twofold. One is there are a lot of password leaks happening and password dumps happening. So if there's a breach, um, you want to make sure those passwords get changed. Second, you know, it has to do with the time it might take to brute force a password. So if I'm able to get a, an encrypted password file, you know, how long would it take a, a relatively high end computer to, to crack those passwords? And I think the, the better your organization does on requiring complex passwords and implementing two factor authentication, the more comfortable I am with pushing out that password change requirement. Um, and uh, there are there are password management tools out there, you know, um, things like LastPass and others that you can get really complex passwords. Most of my passwords are, you know, 20 character passwords. I don't even know what they are. Um, and then I have that password manager protected with two factor authentication and a very complex password. Um, the other thing, you know, if you want to kind of Another kind of tip that I like to give around complex passwords is it doesn't have to be a random string of characters and numbers that you'll never remember. Um, there's a tool out there, and I'll kind of say this, grc.com, so uh, golfromeocharlie.com slash haystack.htm. And it's a really cool tool for showing you how long it would take to brute force a password. Um, so you, I wouldn't enter your real password in there. Um, I never would put my real password in anything, um, but you can do something similar and see how quick it would take to, for, for somebody to crack that password. Um, what I often recommend is if you string a couple of words together with numbers, like I say, like if you say Batman is awesome as your password and the A and awesome is an at sign, 
Um, you know, that's a really hard password to crack because it's it, these things are all about brute force. Um, so, you know, I definitely think rotating passwords is important, especially if you don't have the capability to monitor for breached passwords. Um, but the more complex the password is, and if you have two-factor authentication, and then I'm more comfortable with you kind of extending out the, the cycling of those passwords. Thank you. Julie, anything to add to that? No, I agree. We actually have a really cool training um, exercise that when you go through, because Proofpoint, we have really complex passwords. Um, it's very difficult to remember mine. Um, but when I when you do the training for it, they have you put in samples of things that you're thinking of, and it tells you how fast um, somebody could crack it. So he's absolutely right. I I agree with everything that's just said. Really. Anyone else on the panel on, on the password question? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think Vince really nailed it, but um, yeah, just the use of a password manager if possible is great. That way you get those long, complicated passwords. You don't have to worry about people, you know, just adding a new number to their password every three months or whatever it is. Um, and you can, you know, allow for a little more variety there. Thank you. So we've got about three minutes to go and uh, you know, we have a very uh, experienced panel over here. Do you have any success stories, any, any good BEC success stories for our, uh, uh, for our uh, uh, listeners? Uh, basically, you know, where, where uh, a threat was uh, stopped or uh, there was, uh, was the, the, the uh, culprits were, or the, the folks who were trying to, the fraudsters rather, were uh, apprehended and things like that. Any, any, any kind of good success stories? Let me start with you, Ryan, because you guys do takedowns and that's a cool term, uh, and things like that. And then uh, I'm, I'm gonna ask uh, the, the whole panel after that, if they have any success stories that they can share. Yeah, so um, with the success, you know, there's obviously the preventative measures. So, you know, sometimes we'll go out and we'll find uh, maybe on a doc site, one of uh, an executive at a company we monitor for, right? And we're able to get all their information, um, you know, usually or not usually, um, occasionally it's listed alongside passwords. So we're able to notify them almost immediately that, hey, your information appeared here, change your passwords, beware of, you know, probably some very sophisticated spear phishing attacks that may be coming your way. Um, but then, you know, on more on the side of like when the business email compromise attempts happen, uh, like I had mentioned earlier, we are able to do those takedowns. So if a, an email domain, um, a typo squatted domain is detected, uh, you know, just the other week, we were able to go within, I want to say 12 hours of detection. Uh, we had that email domain taken down um, and remediated that threat. But yeah, I don't want to speak too much. I'm sure everybody else has great stories too. So thank you. Teresa, anything from the financial services? I mean, uh, of course, we have to uh, make sure we don't disclose the, <laughs> the details. Well, I, I mean, I can kind of share a little bit of our basics. I mean, we do have lots of success stories, but the success comes from the communication and sharing that our members are doing with each other. So, you know, if Eagle Bank says anything, they can say, hey, we're seeing this strange um, trend uh, in fraud or a strange trend in people trying to take over accounts and things like that. And, and you can share those experiences because, as I mentioned before, this is a high volume type of attack, even though, um, you know, they are specializing more and more. You hear things about deep fake audio and even video these days. But um, I mean, the truth of it is, is that it's, it's still a fairly low sophistication attack and just classical social engineering against a human being. So they are targeting more than one person. They are targeting more than one company. So it's probably out there somewhere. You know, if, if you don't have the benefit of an ISAC like us, um, there is a retail and hospitality ISAC and oil and gas ISAC and, you know, things like that. But if you don't have that benefit, you know, it could just be, you know, like a, an association, an, an industry association you belong to. It could even just, you know, be Googling. Lots of people do talk about BEC type of scams online. There are a lot of researchers like the ones you see on these calls that, that do blog about the latest campaigns that they're seeing. And so there is a chance that somebody has seen it. So if you do have questions about it, you know, you're not alone, you know, look to see if somebody else has reported it, maybe a very quick search on the internet, 
um, you know, maybe even, you know, asking whoever it might be your local cybercrime type uh, police or, or fraud um, police. If you have a local FBI office, if you have um, a local, if you're in a city, for instance, a lot of the big cities like New York do have cybercrime um, units, things like that. So, you know, maybe reach out and find out who those people are and try to see if they've heard those types of reports lately. But there are a lot of resources online. So just remember that more than likely, you're not alone. Um, so, you know, try to see that safety in numbers and that type of mutual defense if you can. Fantastic. I was actually going to ask you to uh, talk a little bit about the ISACs and you did. Thank you very much. Well, with that, folks, uh, we're at the top of the hour. I want to take this opportunity to thank my panel. Some have woken up uh, early or have, uh, you know, spent a, a major portion of uh, uh, their day ready for ready for this uh, uh, panel. So thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Brian, for kicking us off and, uh, uh, you know, on a, on, a, on a good trajectory. So um, with that, uh, I guess it's a wrap. Thank you very much once again, dear panel, for joining and for all the folks who uh, are listeners. Uh, I, I hope this was useful. And we'll be sending out an email with some links uh, to some white papers and also uh, some uh, documents which are best practices so that you can have uh, something to uh, browse through and also uh, refer to. With that, thank you very much. Thank you.